All right, can we give a warm Metro welcome to Pastor Lynn, who's joining us this morning? He's our guest. Lynn is a dear friend. Uh, Lynn is a veteran of the faith. Uh, Lynn has been, uh, we've been going to a prayer meeting of leaders here in the Valley, San Fernando Valley, for, uh, it's been going on 20 years, I would say. Um, and so a long time praying for you guys, praying for revival, praying uh, with other pastors and ministry leaders around the valley who want to pray for revival. And so we have a great crew showing up. If you know any other pastors or leaders, encourage them to get involved. It's Thursday mornings from 9 to 10, and we would love to partner with them because God's doing a, a bigger work in our city. And um, so I'm really excited to have Lynn with us this morning. He is a veteran, and I want to ask him some questions. Uh, Lynn has written um, some amazing uh, books. Do we have a graphic of his books that he's written? Uh, Lynn has written these four books, and um, one of these books here, his newest book, uh, Jesus' Secrets, is a gift to each one of you or one per family on the way out. So can we thank him in advance for his amazing hospitality? Um, and uh, what, I, what I love about Lynn, and I wanted to start here, Lynn, if we could. And uh, you're on, right, by the way? I think I am. Oh, good, yeah, good. Am I on? <laughs> That's important. It'd be tough to do an interview if we could. Um, so mm. this is what I love. As a pastor, I love unity, and I love the body of Christ, the church at large. Lynn... Um, served, when he came to faith, he, he served 10 years as a college career um, pastor at a um, very mega church, conservative church, did not express spiritual gifts in any kind of way. And then later uh, served at a charismatic church for another 30 or so years, years. 20, 28 years. And what I love about Lynn is he's got this broad diversity with the whole family of believers. And now he's uh, the Lord has kind of shaken him to do one thing and to do it really well and to share it with all of us. And it, and it has to do with neighboring and loving neighbors. Can you tell us how you went from pastoring, you know, conservative churches, no spirit filled to a spirit filled environment. And after that ministry is done, the one thing that matters most to you that God has shown you is neighboring and sharing the power of it. And the, the right. Uh, just, Anyway, I'm glad you're all here, and I just want to welcome you personally. Uh, to answer your question, Brian, I, um, many, many years ago when I was a college pastor at that large church you're speaking of, I would uh, always felt like there was something missing in the church. I wasn't quite sure what it was. And I read every book that I could on the church, and I was never satisfied with any of the books that I read about the church to find out what I was missing. Years and years and years later, I realized that it was, it was loving your neighbor as yourself. It's really the, the Lord's greatest commandment. That that was the most significant thing uh, that I, I realized that was missing from the church. And uh, at the same time, when I was reading all those books, uh, we lived in an apartment in, at that time was Sepulveda. And um, there was... Um, we, I, I, because I had I wanted to see people come to faith right from the get-go, I started praying with some people in our apartment complex, and we would pray every Thursday night for our neighbors, not realizing that this was really what was missing in the church, is that the whole church being involved in loving the neighbors outside the church. And so what I, I, we began to pray, and just some amazing things took place in an apartment complex. And, um, and so that's kind of how it got started. And I kind of did it as an avocation. It wasn't like this is a part of my ministry. This is just what Christians should do, and that's what we did. And eventually, I ended up at Talbot Seminary. I had a professor named Joe Aldrich. And Joe Aldridge, uh, he was a pastor of Mariner's Church, but he also went on to be uh, the, the president of Multnomah Bible College. But uh, every time I come to class, he would share a story about what he was doing in his neighborhood. And it just intrigued me because this is what I was involved in. And he, he, was, he became like my mentor, if you will. And I always just felt like this is something I w we were supposed to do. But uh, I was at a, an event called Stand in the Gap in Washington, D.C. Coach McCartney said, go back and win your city. And as things began to unravel, I should say, re be revealed to me, I began to realize that this was a, 
a part of it. So, what God wanted to do across, you know, kind of across the whole country. And uh, so I, that was back in 2000. Uh, actually, that was 1997. And it now has given birth. You'll see the, the neighborhood movement actually going across the whole country. So that's kind of how, in a short manner, that's how it goes. Beautiful, beautiful. And in reading uh, Lynn's books, um, this, this centrality of loving your neighbor, he pointed out some really cool things. And we're going to talk about some of the key secrets in this book, as many as we can get to. Uh, but there's an overarching theme, and I, I thought it helped me the first time I read it in one of your earlier works. You had quoted, um, in loving your neighbor, what is neighbor? And it's an interesting word, neighbor. It's like, what is that? Ba it's a weird word, and where does it come from? And it was revealed in the earlier work, what neighbor means, N-E-I-G-H, is those who are nigh to you. From an old English word, those who are nigh to you, meaning in proximity. So those who are not, when God wants you to love your neighbor, not really around the world, around the globe, or something that you just can't pull off, but near you. And so you, you use this conversation about how God is strategic and kind of makes it easy because of he just put people in our circles. And that is a, a secret. Tell, tell us what you found about the secret of nigh and God's design about what he already did there. Thanks, Brian. Uh, one of the things I, I began to realize, and you'll see this in the conclusion of the book, that where you are with those who are outside the church is by God's design. Got it? It's by God's design. And so, as, as Brian mentioned, neighbor means near, or near one. So, think, here's, here's a, a term, in, or terms you need to remember. Jesus thinks in geographic proximity. Do you follow it? Geographic proximity has to do with those people who are nearest to you. And that's so important for the advancement of God's kingdom. You need to begin to see that the near ones are really the ones that God's most concerned about and for you to reach. If you remember the story of the Good Samaritan, the expert in the law tried to corner Jesus and he didn't really have a full understanding of what it meant to have a neighbor because he justified himself by saying basically that I love my neighbor. But it, he was thinking actual neighbor. But Jesus was broadening the idea of neighbor. It's whoever crosses your path. And these are the people that God has in mind for you and I to reach. This is our mi mission field are those who are nearest to us. And I think the church really hasn't done a great job of helping to equip people in the church to love those people who are nearest to you. And that's the book itself. That was what it's designed for this particular book. So the first three books that I've written are about neighbors, loving your neighbor. But this one, everything streams out of your home. Here's, here's, here's the, I think the reason why the church is often impotent is because we've made the building the center rather than where you live. So everything flows out of your home uh, and to your neighbors and to where you work and to where you play. And so this particular book is designed so that as you work your way through it, you'll begin to see how you can actually begin to love your nigh ones. That's great. So again, if you get one thing to today, God sovereignly placed those near to you. If you want to see God's work move in your life, start there. Don't start anywhere else. Start right where he placed you, grow where he planted you. He put people all around you that need him. He knew what he was doing. Don't be dreaming off somewhere in the sunset. Start with, and to the Samaritan story, again, the gentleman was saying, well, I love the people that live next door to me. And they were probably other devout Jewish people. That was very easy for him to do. But walking down the road and there was a guy on the road in front of him, that guy was near to him. And the story is the Pharisee walked all the way around saying, I don't want anything to do with him. So those that are nigh to you, God put there. That's really important. Um, this book focuses on Jesus' secrets. And I remember when uh, Lynn was working on this book, we were praying for his next book, and this one came out, and I remember him sharing the title. And I, I, I love the title, The Secrets. Um, you know, when you look at everything Jesus shared in the gospel, most of the time, oftentimes, he spoke in parables. And all of the parables are about the kingdom of God. And 
it's important. A lot of adults don't know the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? Well, it is heaven. Well, that's the end part of the kingdom of God or the final or the everlasting part. What about this part here and now? And a lot of people don't really get it. It's quite simply the realm. Everyone say realm. It's the realm of God. And one day you stepped into it and one day you were not in it. But when you stepped into it, now you're in it. Now you could be walking down the street with your friend. You're in the realm of God and your friend is not. Same place, same time, same conversation going on. One's in the realm, one's not. One's under the influence of God's lordship, the other one's not. One has the blessings, promises, and protections of God, the other one, does that make sense? So the realm, when you say yes to Jesus, you step into this realm. Now, all of the parables, Jesus would share a secret, and, and sometimes the apostles would say, can you tell us what that parable meant? I mean, I, we heard you, but what does it mean? And Jesus would say, okay, listen up. It means this. And what's beautiful about what you've done, Lynn, is you've skimmed the gospels on all of these really core central issues in this book. And it presents just a very user-friendly, very easy to consume. Here is a simple secret truth of the kingdom. If you just understand these simple things, you're going to see God's needle move in your life. You're going to see him. You're going to be proactive with him on these secrets. So let's talk about some of these secrets because they are secrets. Um, in the second chapter, you, you say this amazing thing. You, you, you call it the secret of caring like Jesus did. And I like how you framed it. You know, it's like, well, some people care more than others or, you know, it's what's my style. But you brought up the scripture um, in James 2.13. You said, mercy triumphs over judgment. The Pharisees did not think that way. But when we can... It opened, tell us why, especially today, the way the church is known or seen or viewed, this is so key to starting everything. Uh, one of the things probably is one of the greatest blemishes on the church is judgmentalism toward those who are outside the church. And it's easy for us to do that because we understand the grace of God and, and the life we're now living is a life that he's allowed us to live. But we can look down upon people who are out there in the world. And Jesus didn't do that. Jesus had compassion. In fact, in, in Matthew chapter 9, he said he looked on the multitude with what? Compassion. And he saw them as sheep without a shepherd, that they were harassed and helpless. Now think about it this way. They were harassed because the Romans were harassing them. They had a very, uh, you know, uh, dictatorship, if you will, with, from Rome, coming from Rome. And the Romans treated them terribly. And then the religious leaders treated them terribly. So Jesus saw them as sheep without a shepherd and uh, that they were harassed by it. And he uses a, 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 a parable or a story to explain what it is like to have a sheep without a shepherd. And he, he says the sheep without a shepherd, basically the, the, the disciples would have fully understand what it was like to have a sheep without, to, have, to be a sheep without a shepherd. And see, domestic sheep, if they don't have a shepherd, they'll die. If they fall over on their back, they'll die. They, they are very fearful. This is basically what he's saying. This is what people are like out there without a shepherd. And if you remember the day when you were without a shepherd, I remember what I was like. And I'll tell you, people could have, who were believers could have definitely judged me for the way I was living my life before I became a Christian. But there was somebody when I was on a, a base in Thailand during the Vietnam War who began to love me and have compassion. He spent nine months and ultimately he brought me into the Lord's kingdom. But it was because he loved me and he had compassion. So those people that you know around you that aren't believers, if you kind of flip it, instead of being judgmental, you begin to love them. And you'll begin to see the transformation in, in their lives because they'll begin to respond to you in a completely different way. Because believe me, most people out there believe Christians are judgmental, right? Very good. Think of how different we would be viewed if we just approached it the way Jesus did. Amen? In fact, Jesus was accused of being a friend of sinners, right? That was like a, the Pharisees thought that was a really bad term, and Jesus took that as a compliment. 
You shared an interesting thing on that point. You, you had mentioned that our circles, the longer we're in the faith, oftentimes the less sinners we have in our life. Now listen, we're all working out our salvation, so nobody's arrived when it comes to sin. That's not the point. But we made a decision about sin. We used to just, be, it was normative and we accepted it, but at some point we said, I'm turning from that, I'm walking with Jesus. Is that right? Anybody in this room? That's, that's, that's the aim, right? But the longer we're in the faith, the less people we know that are further out there. And that's something we have to change. And it will start with mercy is greater than judgment. And, and it's certainly easier to give judgment than it is to give grace, isn't it? So easy to give judgment. Just, boop, just really dismissive, boom, move on, make a statement and move on. It's not what Jesus does. Grace is what it's all about. So that's really, really important. Um, in your third chapter, you talk about, I love this, you talk about the difference between success and value. And I love the analogy you gave. You, you said that some people uh, end up climbing the ladder in life. They climb this ladder and they finally get all the way to the top only to find out that their ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. Oops. And that's not success. There's no value in that. So you, you share an amazing secret about value success and, and it's, you really tied it to serving like Jesus, which nobody is thinking of value and success being this way, but it's a key to unlock major aspects of the kingdom. You wanna break that down for us? Thank you. Well, Jesus uh, makes a statement that uh, those who are greatest in the kingdom will be really the lowest, right? It, it's an upside down kingdom. And when you move into a place of service, in fact, in the John 13, where Jesus washes the disciples' feet, they, I mean, Peter didn't want him to do it. But what Jesus was portraying, I, I call it in the book, a one act play. What he does is he, he indicates, if you're gonna be a follower of mine, you're gonna have to do what I just did. It and that is to wash feet. And that was the lowliest people were the ones who would wash feet in that day. And or even children would be the, the foot washers. And so Jesus gets down and he washes their feet. And then he says, if you do this, he said, you'll be blessed. And so he was flipping it. And I, you know, I was in a ministry where the college group went from 35 to 500, probably 700 were a part of it. And I was at the top of my game and the Lord pulled me out of there. I mean, literally just pulled me out of there. And I got a very lowly job. Yeah, very, I was working in a warehouse. And anyway, I was in a very lowly job. And the Lord revealed to me that success is not about climbing some ladder, but it's really about being in his will, right? And so and it really gets down to being where God wants you to be. And uh, it, was, it was just a beautiful experience. But what, what the Lord revealed to me during that season, I, I, was, I, was, I was a jerk with my wife and my kids. I, I really wasn't much of a servant at all. And one day I found my wife just crying in the, in the dining room. I said, what are you crying about? She said, I don't feel very loved. And it finally, after, I mean, she's trying to tell me over and over that I needed to do more work around the house as a father and as her husband. And I said, and when she was crying, I just gripped my heart. And I said, well, where do you want me to start? And she said, well, you can at least start by washing the dishes. And, and so I started washing the dishes. And one day she said to me, now I want you to know, uh, Lynn, that it's more than washing dishes. But that's, that's just where you start. Because I thought, I, to this day I'm washing dishes. And so it's important to carry that act of service out into the world so that people understand that you are a servant. That is the highest position you can get in the kingdom, is to be a servant. Is that ironic? But not so in this world. It is about going up a ladder. And you'll read in the book just my whole story, a bit of my story there about how I became a servant. And that's really how you impact. I mean, we have my daughter-in-law who was with us and I am, she comes out from Arizona all the time to do hair. 
And uh, she lives with us for the weekend and then goes back. But I, she's yet to become a believer, but she's very close. Her name is, you can pray for her, her name is Lauren. Jewish, she's Jewish, but she talks about God all the time. And her daughter, her three-year-old daughter, her four-year-old daughter is probably going to lead her to the Lord. But uh, anyway, it, but it's about, I serve her because that is one of the most powerful things you can do in touching the lives of people. In fact, it says of Jesus that he went around in Acts, I think it's Acts 12, he went around doing good. And so if you begin just out there in the world to be different, whether it's in a restaurant with your waitress or where it is, wherever it might be, you're doing good. And it, it'll, it'll really impact the lives of people. And it is such a missing link in such a self, uh, self-serving society, right? We have Facebook and whose face is on there? My face and my space and my followers. And my, this is just the world we live in. Other societies didn't live that way, but we do. Everything is about us. So especially in the church, it's very noteworthy when you're willing to serve others. When you go out, people, people realize it's remarkable. And I would say on that note, you know, when I became a newer believer, I was going to all the Bible studies I could because I realized that this is true. And I never knew this was true my whole life until I came to faith. And I'm like, this is remarkable. However, when I was asked to go serve downtown with the homeless, I jumped in just because it's probably the next step is what I figured. And I began, God began to shape me and mold me. I began to see the kingdom of God. We're talking about secrets of the kingdom. I I learned about them in Bible study, but I got to, I got to experience them as I began to serve God and be selfless because there's only things you will learn out there when you're doing this. And so all of these secrets, when you apply them, you're going to have to be selfless and let God move in your life. It's a choice you have to make. But when you do, you begin to see things open doors and things unlock and God changing lives. It's really remarkable. Speaking of God using you and um, even identifying, some of you guys are praying right now. You're trying to identify, God, what are you doing? What are you doing in my life? And this is important because we all want to be in the zone of knowing, recognizing, don't we? How many, like, the worst thing is like missing out on something God wanted to do and like you missed it? That would be like an epic fail, right? Like, God, if you're going to do it, please, I want to know, I want to get in. You, you bring up this point uh, in your book. Uh, you, you have a chapter on it here. You also devoted a book to it. And you talk about the timing of God. And you talk about the chronos time of our watch, that some of you guys have calendars and you're really amazing at delineating exactly what you're doing every minute and every hour and effective. And if that's okay, it's a personality style. And the um, kairos time where God's doing something, but sometimes we completely miss it. And, and, and you, 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 you just bring this to life for us to get it in front of us in a way that maybe we will rethink timing. Can you explain Kairos, Kronos, how it affects us, how we could recognize it, how we could um, shift, really? Because if we don't shift in this area, we're going to stay on the same track and we're going to be hearing about what God did instead of being involved with what God did. Can you tell us how we do that? Let me just read this passage here. Uh, this is in Ephesians 5, 14 through 7. It says, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be care- very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. And the word there is kairos, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And the idea there is not what is your Lord's, the Lord's will for your whole life, but what is the Lord's will in the moment in which you're living today? And when you get in touch with Kairos, uh, Kairos is an opportunity. And these are opportunities that God creates for you to enter into. When you enter into Kairos, you enter, literally, you enter into a, a, a nether realm. I am now in that realm and never want to go back to that realm where I'm not aware of what God is doing in the moment. So what does he say? The first thing he says, wake up sleeper. Now, wait a minute. I'm awake. I'm wide awake. The problem is the church can be completely asleep and unaware of what God is doing in the moment. And I'll tell you, this is something that the whole neighboring thing is wonderful. But this is a realm that the Lord has brought me into 
to where I understand what he's doing and how it, it's just an amazing experience to be a part of. And sometimes he will have you wait and sometimes he'll wait, ask you to invite you into something he's doing. And uh, it, it, Dallas Willard, there's a quote that just really struck me, it's always stuck with me. He said, don't ever try to make anything happen. See, if you try to make something happen with people who are outside the church, you end up you're probably causing more trouble, that, you know. But when you're in the flow of what God is doing or the Spirit of God is doing in the minute, you're, you become more and more aware of, of the workings of God. That's why Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. In other words, he could see what the Father's doing. And that's what he wants you to enter into, that you can begin to see what he's doing. So what, what uh, da Dallas said, if you keep moving forward with what you're doing, we'll see revival and awakening. And I go, well, wait a minute, how, how does that happen? And what the Lord revealed to me is you pray like Jesus did. You then wait with anticipation. And then you watch like Jesus did. And when the, so in every, everything you see in the Gospels, gee, it, those, all those accounts were accounts that the Father initiated and Jesus entered into. And then when he invites you in, you join him. And uh, see, what are, the, what are the problems? This, this, uh, if I could spend all the time on this, this is so, it is so important. But the, the thing is that when, when man fell, one of the things that happened, he moved away from being childlike. And he became his own God. In fact, Satan said, if you eat of this tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will be like God. He was right there. And we become our own God and we become disconnected from God. But as a child, you begin to enter into a relationship with your father and he leads you into these experiences. I'll close with this, this experience because it's, it's uh, we had COVID. My neighbor who we're very close to as part of our Bible, neighborhood Bible study, when we got, my wife and I got COVID, she invited a friend of hers who she met, who's a doctor uh, at what, in ICU at one of the major hospitals here in LA. She came to our home four times, not a believer. She has now, she came, she cared for us. Uh, we came through the whole COVID experience. But she's now coming to our Bible study every Tuesday night when she's, she's off every, every, every other Tuesday night, she's at our home. She wouldn't miss it yet to become a believer. And I mean, I could tell you a story. Her sis, she invited her sister last Tuesday night. So all of these things are, are what we call kairos. They're opportunities that God gives us. And you enter into that realm. That's what, what, when revival will occur, is when we are in touch, just like Jesus was with the, our Heavenly Father, and we're doing, as he said, what the Father's doing. Because he said, I can do absolutely nothing on my own. And I can't do a thing on my own. So anyway, I'll get it back to you. That's good. No, look, to, let's follow up on that. What, what would you say, because we have a lot of different personality styles. Some are very uh, administrative, gift of administration, where things are chop, chop and very delineated, just as the nature of some people. And some people are more experiential. They're really not looking at their clock. They're enjoying the experience of it. Some of you have probably already looked at your clock and you that already reveals you're one of those chop chop kind of people and you're figuring out you probably already know where you're going for lunch and at what time and who you need. That's fine, we're, we're very diverse. But what would you say to those who are um, highly calendared in this area? That's just their style, God made them that way. What would you say to them to help them understand the God of the moment? Um, I remember in, in Israel, as they're traveling through the desert, one of the words they came up, Jehovah, Jehovah Shema, the Lord your God right where you are at. Not the God out there or the God who's going to come, the one who was and is to come, the God who is, is right now. And so what would you say to those who really do calculate a lot and might be missing out on Kairos opportunities? Well, first of all, I want to say we're grateful for those kind of people, right? We like people that have order, and so living a, a, a degree of chronos is fine. But if you overextend the chronos, if you will, in other words, your clock, the to-do list, and all these different things, you will miss out on what God's doing. 
So you have to kind of rethink. I mean, there's some people that they probably live in Kairos time all the time, you know, they, and they don't get anything done. So I, what I am saying is that Kronos is good to do. But if, if, you don't, if you don't get in touch with Kairos, then you're living like everybody out there in the world is living. They're living a life without God and in a perception of what he is up to in the moment. And when you, be, when you wake up, you have to wake up. You have to, you have to realize, wow, I, I have been missing out on what God is doing. And so I want to now be aware of what he's doing in the moment. And when you start tasting of it, it's not, you, you, how many have ever heard divine, oh, I had a divine appointment. See, it, 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 it's okay to have a divine appointment, but wouldn't you want to have a divine appointment all the time? Wouldn't you want to be in the flow of what God is doing all the time? So I'm basically baiting you right now, if you're one of those Kronos people, that you will begin to say, I want to be in touch with it. So what I would encourage you to do is to begin to pray regularly, pray regularly, and, and for people that, that don't know the Lord that you have relationship with and begin to pray for them, begin to love on them. And the next thing you'll know, you'll begin to experience incredible experiences with these people. But you know what will happen? It'll begin to expand and you'll find yourself having more and more connections with people outside the church because you're praying and asking God. So you pray, you wait, you watch, and then God says, Join me in this. Like the little kid who hears his father say, come on a ride with me. And it is the most exciting ride to be a part of. So anyway, I hope that helps you. I love it. So, so that's praying for people you know that God will give you a Kairos moment with them. Um, the beautiful thing about this is you point out God and his sovereignty is already working in people's lives all around you. More than you know. He's already working. He's giving them dreams. He's showing them things. He's ordaining. You don't really know that, but God is already doing something. So God's looking for you to partner with him in what he's doing because he loves people. So praying for those around you for the Kairos moment is really important. You mentioned another thing, and I, I've seen the power in this one, and I think it's a missing secret in the church. It's literally when, when you run into somebody at 7-Eleven or Trader Joe's or at the gym to actually be able to say, and this is going to take a little bit of courage, but you have to trust that God's doing a work to saying, can I pray for you? Now, that's not something that happens often. I don't know if you can count how many times you've been in a public place and someone has said, can I pray for you? Probably hasn't happened a lot. Maybe in the church it has, but I'm saying out in, you know, in, in your daily routine. But the power of it is this. When you do, people know God sent a messenger. And that messenger is willing to step in and intercede on their behalf. And some people are like, really? Like right now? Yeah, right now. Can I pray for you? I know that sounds bold. Most people will say yes. You've seen this. You said uh, you've been doing this with your Bible study. Tell us how... This flips a switch in people's lives when you're willing to do this. You recognize that Kairos moment. You take that bold step, which is bold. Can I pray for you? A few short words. And how you can trust God with the rest. Well, uh, in John 14, uh, Jesus actually says, John 14, 12 and 13, he says, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do works uh, I have been doing, and they will do even greater works. Whoever believes... Whoever, it's very broad. So I, I had a friend, a dear friend that's at our church, and Anthony over here is, uh, he's, he's a man of prayer, and he, whenever there's a particular need to pray for, Anthony and there's a fellow, John Klein, uh, they, they just, whatever there's a need, they pray for the person. Well, it's one thing to do that in the church with people, but what that pattern that they have initiated in their life to pray for people whenever whenever there's a health issue or whatever it is carry it outside that, that's see that's the tough place to do it i've done it at la fitness i mean i and if you step out god god will meet you when you step out and i mean i you'll read in the book i won't go into the stories but you'll read in the book stories at la fitness my neighborhood things like that so what does that do? One is, it, it's a risk to do it, isn't it? Can I pray for you about that, you know, your condition? I mean, even if it's cancer or whatever it might be, or, or somebody's going through a really difficult time, well, can I pray about that? 
Well, what, they, what does that say? It says something about God, that God cares, and he's caring through you. And whether the Lord heals him or not, that really ultimately is up to the Lord. But I'm going to step out. That's where the risk is taken, to step out. And I, I, you'll read in the book stories of just how God responded to, to prayers like that. But it goes on all the time with people that I'm with. And that really can be an opener because you're now connecting with them more than just serving them and loving them. You're now allowing God into their world by praying for them. And I have people that let me now pray. I mean, like our, our daughter-in-law, she lets us pray for her all the time. You see, so it's, it's, it's really, that's what Jesus did. And he healed people, and it was amazing. Well, that's profound. Uh, I wish we had more time to keep rolling with secrets because there's so many secrets, and they're so good. Um, but I want to just end it maybe on that last note. I'm going to close this out in prayer. But um, you, you mentioned the risk. And in the world, when you take risk, it is sometimes rewardable, and sometimes it is not rewardable. Some financial risk, oops, some career, oops, maybe, hopefully it's rewardable, pray your way through. But in the kingdom of God, all risk is rewardable. In God's kingdom, all risk is rewardable. So there is nothing more fulfilling. I know this, you know this, many of you guys know this. There is nothing more fulfilling than God meeting you in a moment and doing something through you. Even doing something despite of us. It's not that we're the most perfectly positioned people with the great mind and the great heart. No, we're all these works in progress being tuned up along the way, okay? The least likely, we're taken from the bottom of a stone quarry, the Bible tells us, and God put our feet upon the rock. That's, that's what the work God's doing. It's all God. But when God uses you and the kingdom of God becomes manifest through you, not because of you, in spite of you, but God does something beautiful, you're just willing to walk like Jesus and stay in step with the Spirit. And these secrets start happening in your life. You're willing to do them. In the kingdom of God, all risk is rewardable. All risk is rewardable in the kingdom of God. So I wanna pray for us in closing that we will take these secrets, thank you, Pastor Lynn, that we'll apply them in our heart, read these, love the book, highlight it, enjoy it, and then give it to a friend, okay? Share it, because we need to, freely you've been given, freely give, amen? We want to share the kingdom of God. And, and, and I'm just telling you guys, when you get into this zone of giving the kingdom away, you're going to have more joy. You can have society, political, whatever it is, social. You can have stuff going off around you. But, but when you're in the center of the kingdom, you're going to have joy with all that stuff going off around you. You realize that? How many would like that? Amen. Let's close in prayer. Mighty God, we thank you for your word and the power of it. Thank you for Pastor Lynn. I pray for continued blessing on him and his wife and his ministry. Uh, continue to do great things uh, through him, Lord. And Anthony, who's an amazing servant and prayer, prayer warrior who, who walks um, wherever you tell him to go and pray for people. I, I just pray uh, that you would help us with these secrets, that we would hide them in our heart, uh, and they would take life like the parable of the mustard seed, that these would grow in our life and, and it would just uh, take over the whole garden. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you would show us, Lord, how to walk this out, that you would give us courage. I pray for everyone in this room and our online community for a boldness and a courage uh, that we don't have on our own, that you would give us the power to overcome, that you would show us Kairos moments to the moment where God is meeting us or the moment where God's trying to meet a person and you want us to step into it. I pray we'd have the boldness to love and to not judge and to have mercy and to have boldness to pray and to be in step with your spirit and to really love those near to us. And we would just see the kingdom move before our eyes. We would be astounded at what you're doing. We love you, God. I pray for a blessing on everyone's week. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen, amen. Well, God bless you guys. Can we have a round of applause for Pastor Lynn?